2. The Second Age. Chapter 4. The History of Galadriel and Celeborn, and of Amroth, King of Lorien. Part 1. Because the history of Galadriel and Celeborn is so interwoven with many historical events of Arda, this section of the book isn't so much a specific story about them, but rather a complex collection of essays, notes, appendices, and references concerning major episodes of the Second Age, in which these two char characters just happen to play a part. So, if you've been wondering about what happened to Galadriel in the Silmarillion after the first age ends, she kind of drops off the face of the story, right? Then this chapter will give you some insight. However, just be aware that not all of it is exactly definitive because Tolkien didn't have enough time to really finalize everything. So there are going to be some inconsistencies, such as how she meets Celeborn. In an early version, she leaves Beleriand and goes to east before the falls of both Nargothrond and Gondolin, and meets Celeborn in his own land east of the Misty Mountains. Another version states that at the beginning of the Second Age, she and Celeborn live in Lindon, south of the Gulf of Loon. And another source adds that they eventually go over the Blue Mountains and into Eregion. And you know that we've already seen in the Silmarillion that they meet in Doriath, where Celeborn is a kinsman of Thingol. So there are a bunch of different versions. But why would they stick around in Middle-earth after the War of Wrath anyway? Well, there are some different explanations. One reason given is that the Valar explicitly ban Galadriel from returning to Amon, along with all the other leaders of the rebellion, and she proudly replies she'd rather stay in Middle-earth anyway. So there. But then, by the time of the events of the Lord of the Rings, she wants to return to Amon, and she is only granted that wish because of her services in fighting Sauron and her refusal to take the One Ring from Frodo. However, a much later essay gives a more detailed and somewhat different explanation. It first goes into a description of Galadriel and her family, and some events that we are familiar with from the Silmarillion. We know her father, Finarfin, is half Noldor and Vanyar, and he marries the Teleran princess Earwen, daughter of Olwë, who is Thingol's brother. So here it states that part of Finrod and Galadriel's reason for going to Middle-earth in the first place is due to their kinship to Thingol. It doesn't really explain why. Did they want to visit him? I don't know. Anyway, Galadriel is described as being the greatest of the Noldor, second only perhaps to Feanor, although she is wiser than he is. She's really beautiful, really tall, and strong of mind and body. And indeed, while her father name is Arthanis, meaning noble woman in Quenya, her mother name is Nerwen, meaning man-maiden in Quenya. Galadriel, the name, is actually a nickname given to her by Celeborn. It means something along the lines of maiden crowned with a radiant garland, and it's in Sindarin. This is because her hair is gold like the Vanyar, but it's mixed with silver like her mother's hair. The Eldar say that the light of the two trees had been snared in her tresses. This may very well have been the inspiration for Feanor to capture the blended light of the trees in the Silmarils, and indeed he begs Galadriel three times for a whole lock of her hair, but she absolutely refuses, so they become unfriends forever. So in The Lord of the Rings, when Gimli asks for one strand of her hair and she gives him three, suddenly that takes on a lot more significance than when you first read it, huh? Kinda cool. Anyway. During the strife of the Noldor in Amon, Gladriel's desire is kindled to go to far-off lands that she can rule herself. However, she seems to be the only one who perceives a darkness in Feanor, even though she doesn't realize that darkness hangs over all the Noldor, including herself. She very willingly goes on the road to exile, even though she, quote, fought fiercely against Feanor in defense of her mother's kin during the first kinslaying at Alqualonde. I'm not sure what that would have looked like. Does it mean literally fight, like with a sword, or fight, like argue and yell? I have no idea. We don't get any more details than that. But anyway... Both her pride and her anger at Feanor push her ahead so that she can thwart him at every move in the future. 
she comes to Middle Earth with the other exiles, she meets Celeborn and Doriath, and she they get married. And this is where we see his Sindarin origin as a kinsman of Thingol. So Elwë and Olwë, they also have a younger brother called Elmo. Elmo has a son, Galathon, who has two sons, Celeborn and Galathiel. Galathiel's daughter is Nimloth. Remember the wife of Dior, son of Beren and Luthien? So according to this, we can see that Galadriel and Celeborn are second cousins. They are probably present during the ruin of Doriath, but they obviously escape. Perhaps they first go to live in Lindon and eventually head over the Blue Mountains early in the Second Age, according to this version. Now here we see she is not banned when the First Age ends, but instead she refuses pardon out of pride, like she doesn't want to come crawling back. It's only after two more ages pass that she passes the test because she wisely rejects the temptation to take the One Ring when Frodo offers it to her. So that was one version. There's yet another explanation from a much later and very short note written during the last month of Tolkien's life. Now this version states that Galadriel is in fact Feanor's equal in greatness. She's opposed to him in everything except in the desire to return to Middle-earth because she has learned all she can from the Valar and now wishes to go out and exercise her talents. So she starts thinking about ships and goes to Alqualonde to live with her mother's kin, where she meets Celeborn. In this version, he's a Teleron prince, being always grandson. So Celeborn is actually the Sindarin version of his name, meaning silver tall, and the Teleron version of his name is Teleporno, which he Sindarized later. Thank God. Anyway, they both plan to build a ship of their own and sail to Middle-earth. But just as they're about to ask the Valar for permission, Melkor destroys the two trees. They fight bravely against Feanor and his followers during the kinslaying and manage to save their ship. Galadriel is horrified at the violence and despairs of Valinor, so they sail off into the darkness without permission from Manwë, and this is how she falls under the ban of the Valar on anyone's return. She and Celeborn get to Middle-earth before the other Noldor do, and they are welcomed by Círdan. They spend their time during the wars of Beleriand not fighting what they believe to be a hopeless war against Morgoth. They instead fear that Morgoth will try to gather more power from the east, so they set about befriending and teaching Dark Elves and men east of Beleriand in an effort to steer them in the right direction before Morgoth can influence them. Well, the elves of Beleriand will not accept that sort of arrangement, because they still think that winning a direct war with Morgoth without the help of the Valar is possible. So Galadriel and Celeborn wind up leaving Beleriand altogether before the end of the First Age, and when that age ends, they just reject the Valar's permission to return to Amon. So this version of the story is obviously very different from the previous versions because it dissociates Galadriel from Feanor's rebellion completely. Also, it changes Celeborn's origin to that of a Teleron prince and grandson of Olwë, which is at odds with all the other accounts that say he's Sindarin. I know, it's a little convoluted, I'll admit that. Concerning Galadriel and Celeborn. So this part, this was written after the publication of The Lord of the Rings, and this section is the main narrative source for events in the west of Middle-earth up until Sauron's defeat in the War of the Elves and Sauron in 1701 of the Second Age. This text doesn't mention a ban on Galadriel's return to Amman, instead stating that she remains in Middle-earth due to a sense of duty not to abandon the land until Sauron is completely defeated. So here it says Galadriel is welcome in Doriath due to her kinship with Thingol. She befriends Melian and meets Celeborn, grandson of Elmo. For love of Celeborn, who refuses to leave Middle-earth, as well as a desire to remain herself, Galadriel stays behind after the War of Wrath. So after the defeat of Morgoth at the end of the First Age, Galadriel and Celeborn cross the Blue Mountains into Eriador. Many Noldor, Sindar, and Green Elves follow them and for a while they dwell near Lake Evendim, north of the Shire. The two become known as the Lord and Lady of the Eldar in Eriador, and this text states that their son Amroth 
is born during this time. But, you know, if they had a son, this probably would have been mentioned in The Lord of the Rings, which it isn't. Whatever. Their daughter, Celebrian, her birthday is not indicated here. So Galadriel becomes aware that some evil servant of Morgoth is on the loose in the east, though she can't quite put a name to it yet. So she and Celeborn move to the east of Eriador, and in the year 700, they establish Eregion, which is primarily a Noldoran realm. She chooses that place because it borders Khazad-dûm, Moria. You see, she's very far-sighted and knows that the only way to defeat the remnants of evil that Morgoth has left in the world is to unite the peoples who are in any way opposed to him. So that would include dwarves. Also, I mean, she is a Noldo, and the Noldor have always had an affinity for the dwarves' love of smith work, not to mention that those two peoples are servants of Aule. Celeborn, however, will always hate dwarves and not have anything to do with them, because in his mind, they're all guilty of murdering Thingol, which led to the ruin of Doriath. Even though it's only the dwarves of Nogrod who did that, and not the dwarves of Belagost, or any other dwarves for that matter, but whatever, Celeborn doesn't care. So one of the people in Galadriel and Celeborn's group is Celebrimbor, who, according to this version of the tale, is a survivor of Gondolin, but in the Silmarillion, you remember, we see that he's the estranged son of Kurufin, who, and he lives in Nargothrond, and then he eventually becomes the lord of Eregion. Well, whichever version you choose to follow, the bottom line is he has an almost dwarvish obsession with crafts. Indeed, he becomes great friends with the dwarves of Khazad-dûm, especially a guy called Narvi, with whom he collaborates on the West Gate. Im narvi hainechant, celebrimbor o eregion teithantithiuhin. Let me just say that this reminds me a lot of how Vikings often indicated on their rune stones, like who carved them and who had them placed. For example, there's a late 10th century rune stone that was found in the churchyard of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, and all that it says is Ginna and Toki had this stone set up. I love that. Isn't that great? Anyway, this elf-dwarf cooperation makes Eregion stronger and Khazad-dûm more beautiful than the two realms could ever have become on their own. Construction on the capital city of Eregion, Austin Edil, is started in the year 750. Sauron gets wind of this and he starts to worry because around this time the Numenorians have been making contact with people up and down the coasts of Middle-earth, including with Gilgalad. And a young Aldarion is already sailing to the far southern coasts of the Harad, so Sauron eventually leaves Eriador and retreats into the land of Mordor in the year 1000. Once he feels secure enough, in the year 1200, he comes back to Eriador, taking on the fairest form he can conjure, and then he starts making his mischief. And in the meantime, Galadriel and Celeborn have been growing in power, and they've made contact with the Nandorin realm of Lorinand, you know, Lothlorien. According to this account, these elves don't have any leaders and just kind of go about their business without worrying much about Sauron. But Galadriel wants to influence them so that they won't fall for Sauron's tricks if he tries to enter their land. She is successful. And we know Sauron isn't successful in Lindon because Gilgalad and Círdan prevent him from ever entering the realm in the first place. But he is successful in Eregion because the Noldor always have that desire for more knowledge. Especially Celebrimbor, who wants to be known as the greatest smith ever, even greater than Feanor himself. So Sauron tells the people of Eregion that he's an emissary of the Valar, and he tries to ingratiate himself with Galadriel. Well, she senses that he's kind of a creep and scorns him, even though she doesn't. She still doesn't know that he is Sauron, the dreaded lieutenant of Morgoth himself. You see, according to a separate note, Sauron hasn't revealed himself as the great enemy at this time. During the Second Age, the so-called Shadow in the East is first perceived around the year 500, and no Numenorians hear of it until Aldarion perceives it during one of his many journeys to Middle-earth. But it's like an ill-defined force rather than a single actor. 
It's not until Sauron forges the One Ring in the year 1600 that his identity is finally revealed. This note also indicates that Sauron used to work for Aule before Melkor corrupted him. Because if Galadriel knew he was Sauron, she surely would not have let him stay in Eregion. I mean, come on. Anyway, Sauron works alone and in secret, and this is unknown to Galadriel and Celeborn. But when he does come out, he gets all buddy-buddy with the elven smiths and teaches them really quite a lot. He actually helps them bring great profit to the realm. But sometime between 1350 and 1400, he eventually persuades them to usurp power from Galadriel and Celeborn. So, Galadriel takes her children and they pass through Khazad-dûm and into Lorinand, where she takes up rule and fortifies the land. But Celeborn refuses to go by way of the dwarven kingdom, because he hates dwarves, so he just stays in Eregion powerless. And Sauron eventually leaves Eregion in 1500, during which time the smiths continue to be busy making the various rings of power. And although Celebrimbor's heart is never corrupted, he is unfortunately fooled, believing Sauron to be what he says he is. But once Celebrimbor finds out about the forging of the One Ring in 1600, he goes and seeks Galadriel's advice. Even though all the rings of power should have been destroyed, she nevertheless tells him to hide the three remaining elven rings and get them far away from Eregion. So he gives her Nenya, which she uses to strengthen and beautify her land. But unfortunately, it also has the side effect of making her have a strong sea longing for the West. So that kind of takes away some amount of her enjoyment of Middle-earth. Bummer, right? And he also gives Vilya and Narya to Gilgalad for safekeeping. Gilgalad ultimately winds up giving Narya to Círdan. And we do know that after a while, Círdan gives it to Gandalf. Anyway, once Sauron finds out that Celebrimbor has rebelled against him, he reveals his true self and his full wrath to everyone. So... He invades Eriador in 1695, and he heads straight for Eregion. Gilgalad sends a force led by Elrond, but they, they have a long way to go. It's a long way from Lindon to Eregion. So before they get there, Celeborn first leads an attack on Sauron, and he joins up with Elrond when the latter finally arrives, but their numbers together just aren't even strong enough to prevent Sauron's host from entering and destroying Eregion. Their main goal is the treasury. So, a desperate Celebrimbor stands before the door and fights with Sauron. But Sauron takes him captive, steals the treasure, and takes nine of the rings. He doesn't find the seven or the three, because they're all hidden. So, he tortures Celebrimbor for their locations. And Celebrimbor cares most about the three rings, so he just allows Sauron to find out about the seven. He tells them where they he tells him where they are. He gives up this information because the seven and the nine were made with Sauron's help. So they're kind of tainted. But Celebrimbor forged the three rings all by himself. So that's why they're more important to him. And once Sauron knows that he's not going to get any more information, he kills Celebrimbor. Then he carries his body on a pole like a banner shot through with arrows as he turns towards Elrond's host. Now let me just pause here and say that this mode of death really reminds me of the imagery typically used to portray Saint Sebastian, an early Christian martyr and Catholic saint. I wonder if Tolkien got inspiration from that. Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, Elrond would be defeated if not for the charge of the dwarves of Khazad-dûm at Sauron's rear. The dwarves come out in force, and they're accompanied by elves from Lorinand, led by Amroth. So, Elrond and his host are able to retreat north, where, a couple years later, in 1697, he founds the refuge and fortress of Imladris, Rivendell. In the meantime, Sauron turns upon the dwarves and the elves of Lorinand, but they retreat into Khazad-dûm and shut the doors behind them, so he cannot enter. All right, so he decides to gain mastery over all of Eriador, killing any man or elf he comes across, and many elves flee to join Elrond's growing numbers in the north. 
And Sauron tries to attack Lindon, where he's sure he can get his hands on some elven rings. However, he has to leave part of his force behind to contain Elrond's host and prevent them from attacking his rear. So, he's kind of spread out a little too thin. Nevertheless, by the year 1700, he is in control of most of Eriador, except for Lindon and Imladris. Gilgalad and the few Numenorians who live in Middle-earth desperately try to protect the Grey Havens, and just as more of Sauron's forces are approaching from the southeast, the great navy of Tar Minas Tir arrives in both the north and the south. The Numenorians help push back and defeat Sauron's host at Sarn Ford, and all of Sauron's forces are compelled to retreat, only to be attacked by the southern Numenorean force that's arrived via the mouth of the river Guathlo, where Vignalonde is located. Remember Vignalonde, the port? Anyway, in this battle, it's called the Battle of the Guathlo, Sauron narrowly escapes, fleeing back to Mordor in total humiliation. From then on, he vows vengeance on Numenor. And meanwhile, Gilgalad and Elrond destroy the army besieging Imladris, thus clearing Eriador of enemies. However, the land is mostly in ruins. At this time, the main stronghold of elves is established in Imladris, and Gilgalad gives the Blue Ring Vilya to Elrond and appoints him as his vice-regent. Also from this time forward, the Numenorians start to make permanent settlements in Middle-earth, thus preventing Sauron from moving out of Mordor for quite a long time. Meanwhile, the sea longing has grown so great in Galadriel's heart that it causes her to leave Lorinand in Amroth's care. She then passes back through Khazad-dûm with her daughter Celebrian, and they go to Imladris, where they find Celeborn, and they live with him there for a while. It's at this time when Elrond first meets Celebrion and falls in love with her. Anyway, Galadriel, Celeborn, and Celebrion soon leave, and they go live on the coast in Belfalas at the place that will later be called Dol Amroth. Many elves from Lorinand also go live there, and it's not until Third Age 1981 that Galadriel finally returns to rule Lorinand. 